Guatemalans take to the streets again for the third consecutive day in rejection of what they have described as a coup d'etat. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan and his Russian counterpart Vladimir Putin met in Russia's castle city of Sochi to discuss common topics of interest. And also, Gabon's coup leader, General Bryce Oligin Gema, was sworn in as interim president by constitutional court judges. Hello from the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba. This is from the south. I'm your anchor, Gladys Quesada, and this are the news. The Cuban government has confirmed the discovery of a new top quality oil well in the province of Matanzas. The state owned company, Union Cuba Petroleo, said that the exploration of the Alameda 2 well, located in Block 9, was undertaken by the Australian company Melbana Energy. They have confirmed that the new well has the capacity to produce up to 1,100 barrels of oil per day. The head of the exploration crew said that the crude oil found is a lighter, thus contains less sulfur than the kind found in the wells of the Havana Matanza Strip. Cuba uses 44% of its domestic crude oil and 4% or 8% of its accompanied gas to generate domestic energy. In other topics, Guatemalans take to the streets again on Monday for the third consecutive day in rejection of what they have described as a coup d'etat. Thousands have marched since Saturday throughout the national territory against what they called the corrupt pact. The, this Monday, as in previous days, they will also demand the resignation of the prosecutor Consuelo Borras and the special prosecutor Rafael Curruchiche, who are accused of orchestrating a coup d'etat. On Monday, demonstrations coincide with the beginning of the handing over process of President Alejandro Giammatte that will be supervised by the Organization of American States and the Department of State of the United States. Also, several organizations called to mobilize in the name of democracy. And Guatemala's Supreme Electoral Tribunal stopped on Sunday the resolution of the Citizens' Registry that temporarily suspended the political party Movimiento Semilla. The top electoral authorities' decision was made official by means of a memorandum in which they keep President-elect Arevalo's party alive as long as the electoral process remains in force on October 31st. The revocation of the suspension was signed on Saturday by the five magistrates of the TSE, who on August 28th had disassociated or dissociated themselves from the decision of the citizens' registrar, one of the officials in charge of the entity. The Supreme Electoral Tribunal urged the three powers of the state to continue to watch over the respect for the popular will manifested in the ballot boxes and the integrity, purity and efficiency of the electoral process. Resolution SRC R3207-2023, issued by the Director of the Registry of Citizens, is suspended until the conclusion of the electoral process. In Mexico, the survey to select the presidential candidate for the ruling National Regeneration Movement, Morena, concluded on Sunday. Delegates from each of the pre-candidates were present in the communities to conduct polls to define the next presidential candidate for the Morena Party. The polling commission of the political party took more than 12,000 questionnaires during the seven days of the poll. On the other hand, the National Council of the Movement calls on the pre-candidates to respect the campaign silence, since the results of the poll will be made public on September the 6th. In Brazil, a collision between trucks on Saturday in the state of Paraná left at least seven people dead and several injured. According to state authorities, the accident was due to the collision of several trucks that ran over several private vehicles on a highway in the district of São Luís do Puruna, located in Balzanova, a municipality in the the metropolitan region of Curitiba. Authorities also detailed that the accident may have occurred due to weather conditions in the area where it was raining and there was heavy fog.
And in Venezuela, the recovery of the Lake Maracaibo is underway. The state-owned co oil company Petróleos de Venezuela, or Perivesa, said they are in the first phase of cleaning the waters in the lake. So far, they have removed from the lake over 1,795 cubic meters of hazardous solid waste, 2,040 cubic meters of non-hazardous waste, and 384 cubic meters of vegetation layer. Restoring Lake Mar Maracaibo is part of the actions led by the Presidential Commission for the Rescue, Conservation and Sustainable Development of the Lake. The plan includes setting up transitory or yeah, transitory facilities for the storage of material impregnated with crude oil in conditions that guarantee the protection of the environment. The cleanup actions include containing and selecting the spill oil. In a new episode of Venezuela on the Move, we travel to Arenas, a community east of Caracas, the Venezuelan capital, where a family found a new source of income in God Britain during the stall brought on by COVID-19. After that, what seemed to be a crazy adventure and temporal activity became their livelihood and motivation. Our colleagues Adriana Sibori and Jesus Romero went to their farm in the mountains and got their story for us. Let's see. <laughs> The work day begins at dawn. Every day, this couple makes these goats who they consider to be part of their family, from which they can attain 300 liters of milk per season. For me, they are women with four legs, because everything is the same. The breastfeeding process, the birthing process, everything. Goat milk is the most similar to maternal milk. It has vitamins, less fat, and is more digestible. They sell their production, but they do not accept their sacrifice. For us, to give away an animal is hard. As a business, we have to give them away because we cannot overcrowd our barns. But it's difficult. We try to find people who take good care of animals and we give them recommendations. They are not animals that can be grazed and fed. They are animals of high diary genetics. They used to sleep in the barns, but now they have installed cameras in the birthing area so they can control the goats when they are not there. This way, they can see what is happening on their device. Victor is their assistant. My thing is to work. This way I earn more money and I can provide for my family. The goats walk daily through these hills. There are 75 of them and they receive complete care, vaccines every three months, and strict sanitary control. These 25 little goats do not lack supervision or feeding bottles. They started with two goats to clean the land, and that turned to a passion and made them stay in the country. First of all, it's a peace of mind that I have. My daughters are still small and they are still studying. This enterprise has helped me economically because my husband had a transportation company. But when the pandemic started, construction was paralyzed. And since we were at home, I told my family to come and help me with the work and we all started to make the farm grow. This was a window to the future. People told me that I was crazy, and I told them that I would have a good herd. And well, here I am, producing. In six years, this farm has managed to even produce French cheeses, which they sell to gastronomic establishments in the capital. Its next step is to become more technological. Adriana Sibori, Jesus Romero, Guarenas, Venezuela. You can find more episodes of our series Venezuela on the Move in YouTube and other platforms. Let's take a short break, but remember you can join us on TikTok at Telesur English, where you will find the news in different formats, news updates and more. Other stories coming up, stay with us.
Welcome back to From the South. On Monday, the Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan and his Russian counterpart Vladimir Putin met in Russia's coastal city of Sashi. Erdogan paid a one-day working visit to Sashi, as confirmed by the Turkish office, with the reactivation of the agreement on the Black Sea Grain deal as the main topic of the meeting. Additionally, the Turkish and Russian head of state discussed other issues on the regional agenda and global agenda, including bilateral trade, the conflict in Ukraine and the tensions on the African continent. At the end of the day, both heads of state will hold a press conference where it is expected that some change in the grain agreement will be announced. Russia withdrew from the deal on July 17th due to the non-compliance of the West. In Sweden, at least 15 people were arrested during a public event for the burning of the Quran in the city of Malmö. Authorities reported that both the men responsible for the call for the public burning of the Holy Book, as well as the people who tried to prevent the burning, were preventively detained in order to maintain public order. According to the police information, the people arrested are suspected of violent disorder and sabotage. The man was identified as a 37-year-old Salvan Momika, known for promoting this type of aggressions against the Muslim community. And the former Italian Prime Minister Giuliano Amaro accused France of having accidentally brought down an Italian Airlines passenger aircraft that crashed down or crashed over the Mediterranean in 1980. Amaro's statement was made on Saturday in an interview to the press, in which he said that a French Air Force missile accidentally shot the passenger jet in a failed bid to assassinate Libya's then leader Muammar Gaddafi. The Libyan leader was supposed to be flying on a military jet heading for Yugoslavia to conference in Tripoli. Amaro also contended that the Italian government tipped off Gaddafi about the assassination attempt, resulting in the Libya's leader not boarding his plane. The Tavia passenger aircraft was flying from Bologna to Palermo on June 27, 1980, with 81 people on board. It didn't arrive at its destination. And the flight 870 from Itavia Airlines took off from Bologna to Palermo on June 27, 1980. One hour into the scheduled flight, the plane disappeared from radar screens. Several hours after, the wreckage of the aircraft was discovered on the Tyrrhenian Sea off the island of Ustica near Sicily. Italian investigators have attempted for years to understand what led to the crash, with the remains of the DC-9 plane having been placed back together and inspected in Rome. Theories on what caused the failed flight have gone from believing it was the result of a terror attack to mechanical or structural failure. However, Judge Rosario Priore claimed that the truth about the plane crash was hidden by the Italian government and members of the Secret Service. And now we move on to other topics. Spain issued new warnings for torrential rains that are expected to continue until Monday. The regions of Madrid, Toledo and Cadiz are under a red alert. Weather authorities forecast 60 millimeters of rain to fall per hour. Spain's civil protection services have asked the population to seek shelter in the upper floors of the residences due to the heavy rainfall. The nation's railway service reported that trains have been interrupted between Catalonia and Valencia. The heavy rains are the result of a slow-moving storm system. It hit the country on Saturday, killing two people who were canoeing on the mountains of Huesca. And more than 380 people are still missing after wildfires affected the U.S. state of Hawaii, in which at least 115 people have lost their lives. Police sources in the Hawaiian island of Maui said the fires left thousands of victims, 2,000 of whom still don't have electricity and 10,000 lack telephone and internet service. Local authorities report that the damage caused by the flames is estimated at $6 billion. State Governor Josh Green described the forest fires that swept through the coastal city of Lahaina in Maui on Tuesday as one of the worst natural disasters in the history of the archipelago, as well as one of the deadliest forest catastrophes in the United States in a century.
An eruption of the Ubinas volcano in Peru has made the government extend for 60 days the state of emergency in seven districts of the Moquegua department. Local authorities said the extension will take effect as from September the 4th due to what they called a moment of imminent danger. The Geological Mining and Metallurgical Institute reported that the volcanic plume rose some 4,000 meters above the crater and recommended the residents to stay more than four kilometers away from the area. Telesur English launches its own videos on demand site for you to go and revisit our interviews, the top stories, the special broadcastings and more. Just go to the top left corner in our website homepage and click on the video option to access our VOD platform. And now we will have a short break. Stay with us. Welcome back. On Monday, Gabon's coup leader, General Bryce Olige Gema, was sworn in as interim president by constitutional court judges. In a televised ceremony, General Bryce Olige Gema, who led a coup last week that toppled Gabon's 55-year-old dynasty, took the oath of office as interim president, promising to hold free and transparent elections after an unspecified period. Olige, head of the elite Republican Guard, led officers in a coup on Wednesday against the president, Ali Bongo Dimba, and in the family ruling since 1967. The ousting came just moments after Bongo, 64, was proclaimed winner in the last month's presidential elections, a result called a fraud by the opposition. The power grip in Gabon is the sixth coup d'etat in an African country in the last three years. In Niger, people are protesting for the third consecutive day, asking for the withdrawal of the French troops present in the country since late July's coup. Chanting French army, get out of our country, Nigerian citizens gathered on Sunday outside a military base housing the French soldiers. The demonstrators once again spoke out against France, whose diplomats and troops refused to leave the country. Nigerians also reiterated their full support for the military government, whose authorities on Friday spoke out against against Paris for backing the ousted president Mohamed Bassem, and they accused France of flagrant interference in Niger's domestic affairs while seeking to perpetuate neo-colonial rule. In South Africa, 77 people have died in a fire that broke out on Thursday, August 31st, in a residential building in the center of Johannesburg. According to the Health Ministry of the Central South African province of Gauden, where Johannesburg is located, of the hundreds of injured in the event, 31 are still hospitalized in the serious condition due to the severity of their injuries. Meanwhile, the National Assembly said it will conduct an investigation into the incident, parallel to the one already being carried out by the police and other authorities. Relevant committees of parliament will be immediately assigned to oversee the immediate and long-term efforts of various branches of government in response of the disaster. In Israel, more than 150 people were injured during a demonstration of Eritrean migrants in Tel Aviv. In the early hours of Saturday morning, two sides of Eritrean refugees clashed in a demonstration, prompting the Israeli police force to take action to control the situation. The police force reported that they intervened to disperse the protest as they felt threatened by the demonstrators. The director of the Issue Love Medical Center in Tel Aviv said that at least 24 people had been admitted and that seven of them were in serious condition. And the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says his country is considering deporting 1,000 Eritreans involved in the riots in Tel Aviv over the weekend that resulted in doses injured, including Israeli police persons. What happened yesterday in Tel Aviv constitutes the crossing of a red line. At the Special Ministerial Committee I established today, we ask for a few swift measures, including expelling a thousand regime supporters who took part in these riots. And the Syrian military forces countered a 
a terrorist attack by foreign troops in the west of Aleppo province. The army repelled this Sunday attacks by suicide group Omar bin Khattab in the towns of Kafar Tal and Kafarama. Syrian military responded to the bombing of the city with bombs, artillery and missiles, while the Russian aviation destroyed fighting positions in the rear. Extremist gangs have stepped up murderous attacks against military positions and residential areas under the administration of the Syrian government. In Iran, Foreign Minister José Amir Abdullahian met with his Turkish counterpart Hakan Fidan on Tehran. The meeting is part of both nations' commitment to strengthen comprehensive cooperation relations cooperative relations. The Turkish diplomats' agenda includes meetings with Iranian government authorities with the aim of increasing bilateral cooperation. This is Minister Fidan's first visit to Iran as Turkey's foreign minister. And we have come to the end of this news brief. But remember, you can find this and many other stories on our website at teleswithenglish.net. And also, if you feel so inclined, please join us on social media for all the latest news. We are on Facebook, X, Instagram, Telegram, and TikTok for Tell Us With English. As always, I'm your anchor, Gladys Quesada. Thank you for watching. We share your feelings.